what's the difference between a dirty old man written by an old man and a dirty old man written by a young woman? Is there actually any difference at all? This is just one of a lot of interesting questions I'll be asking our guest today. I'm Angus Stewart, and you're listening to the Translated Chinese Fiction Podcast. Our guest is none other than the amazing Chinese to English translator, Nikki Harmon, and I had an amazing chat with her. Before we get to that, I'm just going to do the plugs, as always. So, if you'd like to support the show, financially that is, to help me cover hosting costs, there's two places you can do it. There's Patreon, patreon.com slash trchfic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C, and then for a one-off contribution, there's Buy Me a Coffee, buymeacoffee.com, trchfic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C. But uh, all that aside, let's get on with the interview. Let's hear from Nikki. So on the show, uh, we have Nikki Harmon, a Chinese to English translator of very great repute and one of the so-called Gang of Four behind Paper Republic, a website that's popped up more than a few times on the show and in the show notes. So as I understand, Nikki, you've been pressing apples all day. Is that right? Oh, <laughs> um, all afternoon. Yes, it's a very good year for apples. We got a small orchard. So I now feel I'm impregnated with apples. So very happy to talk to you about something completely different from apples. <laughs> okay, um, no more apple talk. No, um, apple talk. <laughs> it's a very English thing to be doing, though, I'll say that. Yeah. So enough of the apples. Can you tell us a wee bit about yourself and then um, maybe a wee bit about Paper Republic as well? Yes. Uh, well, I started translating uh, about 20 odd years ago. And a bit more than 10 years ago, I got to know Eric Abrahamson, who'd set up Paper Republic, the website. And it was basically at that time a forum for translators to chat to each other. But it very soon became something more important. It's become the, if I can coin a phrase, the go-to place if you want to know anything about new Chinese writers, uh, what they're writing and translators and so we've now oh, quite exciting we've just become registered as a, a charity in the uk so we hope to do lots more fundraising and lots more projects so our projects are uh, publishing short fiction which is free to view online and providing a uh, a database which is also free to consult for anyone who wants to know more about Chinese fiction in English translation and generally introducing the best works in in translation to general readers in English all over the world. Uh, following up on what you said about the database, so in my dissertation, what I seemed to find was that some countries, uh, the examples I found were Ireland and uh, South Korea, they have national institutions that kind of provide their own create a database for translators and in the case of China there isn't one so Paper Republic's kind of stepped in to fill that role is that more or less correct? Yes I, I, I think that more or less describes it I mean obviously we I, I think any of us involved in the translation and the literary world uh, of Chinese fiction we know that that people in China writers in China the government organizations publishers they all want a Chinese literature to become better known in foreign languages. Absolutely. But we, I think we can do something which is a bit special because we're independent and we kind of occupy a midpoint between any Chinese writers who maybe don't speak English, Chinese government organisations who are not by their nature independent, but we are independent, yeah. and general readers in the West, in Arabic countries in all countries all over the world who were translating from Chinese into their languages, they all find the kind of resources that we're producing and the kind of contacts that we can provide them with extremely useful. I mean, we're non-profit. We do, we mm. do it all because we really want to provide opportunities for readers in other countries to read fiction translated from Chinese. Mm. And a literally a more superficial question. I really like the kind of design and aesthetic Paper Republic website has, nice and minimal. Uh, did it always look so kind of um, cool or did it have more humble beginnings? 
I think it had pretty humble beginnings. I, I wasn't there right at the beginning. Eric Abrahamson said recently that he taught himself WordPress and is it the trouble? Well, it's not the trouble. The, the thing, the design has changed now because it's had to change because we've got so much more material on it. Of course, yeah. And that is a challenge for, for Eric and for all of us. We've had to learn how to design it to make it uh, really user-friendly. He's really the genius behind it. <laughs> I like the current design. I also like also like to make sure when we put up posts that we add a picture or two. Mm. Um, but yes, it's a fairly plain design and functional design. Yeah, yeah. The wee little art banners that go up with the free short stories are are really nice. I like those a lot. Dave Dave Haytham, he's brilliant at doing those. He does a different one for every story. Oh right, okay. So it's all the one the one artist. Uh, I don't know where he gets them from, but I'm very happy with them. They look lovely. I see. That's cool. Um, so as much as I'd love to keep asking you these questions about yourself and Paper Republic, I think we should crack on and talk about the book for today's episode, which is The Chili Bean Paste Clan by Yan Ge. Although, do stop me if I start calling it The Chili Bean Paste Gang. I have done that um, once or twice in real life and on the podcast, I think. Yeah. Well, they are they are quite a gang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You want to say something about what the book's about? My summary of this book would be we're in um, a small town in Sichuan called Pingla, mm -hmm. and we're following a family, the Chili Bean Paste Clan, but mostly, I don't know if you could call him the patriarch, because um, his it's his mom that's maybe really in charge, but mm. one of the one of the pillars of the family is mm. uh, Shen Xiang, who's the boss of the um, the family's chili bean paste factory, which they've inherited, uh, more or less. And he's he's already in a bit of a moral black hole when the story starts, I guess. And he, it's not really even about him climbing out of it, but it's about him dealing with um, developments in the family and secrets coming out, kind of a universal theme. That would be my incredibly muddled, not very streamlined elevator pitch for the book. Oh, I think that's absolutely great. I love the idea of him being in the moral black hole because he really is in a moral black hole and there are all sorts of secrets that come out uh i mean we can talk a bit more about his character in, in a moment i think one thing to say is because i'm going to refer to the characters by their family relationships it's a good idea the narrator is the daughter and the daughter never appears so she's yes. um, we understand she's <clears throat> a, um in a mental hospital so she's uh, a teenager, she's had some kind of a mental breakdown, and the way the family reacts to that is part of the story. But also, she is telling the story in hindsight, because when uh, she gets out of the mental hospital, it is understood that she gets the whole story about what's happened uh, from her various relatives. So she's always talking about dad, who is yes. Run Xiang, mum, who is the put-upon wife, yes. and then Gran, who's the matriarch, and then a dad's elder brother is referred to as uncle, and uh, that's kind of nice. It 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 also means that um, people who have problems in the translation in remembering characters whose names are written in pinyin, mm -hmm. um, they can remember them as dad, mum, gran, uncle, and and sis. Of course, there's an uh, older sister as well. Yeah, I think the the only point where that got anything close to confusing for me was that uh, grandma in the story she mostly functions as a mum as Shen Chang's mum but obviously she's an old lady so it's never it never threw me um but yeah it's, it's I totally forgot to ask you about it I think because it's it's pulled off in such a subtle way that um this daughter is totally I guess I'm sure there's a correct literary term for this but she's in the background um she's referred to and you get just enough clues to know what's going on with her, but not enough that it's at all really foregrounded in the story. And the readers' reactions to that in the to the in the English translation they've been really interesting. Mm. Um, I'll tell you the good reactions first. One one or two people who've written really nice reviews have said that they they felt that I mean he is a real shit. He's such a dick. <laughs> Dad, he is in such a moral hole. Yeah. Um, and he's a scumbag and he's a philanderer, but he's also quite 
loyal to his his elderly mother, Gran. Um, yes. So he's not a total joke. But the point is that having his story uh, told by his daughter, uh, a, a number of readers felt that that made him somehow made it less awful. That actually some of the th- things he does are, are really awful. But somehow having them told through the words of the daughter. Ah, uh, it's it's kind of nice. It kind of softens the blow. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the other hand, another reader uh, who wrote about it said she couldn't she couldn't accept the fact that a teenage daughter was privy to all her father's philandering activity affairs and so on. But um, so people have had different reactions to the daughter. But as you say, it's very subtle. She mm-hmm. didn't really obtrude, intrude. Yeah. Um, so I, I felt because the, I'm going to ask you a different question about it, but the, the opening master of the English uh, version, obviously the one I read, um, has a wee intro from Yanga. And if I remember right, she implies or says outright in it that this novel is kind of based on her having left China, but reminiscing about her family and her time growing up in small town Sichuan. So I felt when I was reading it, the kind of slightly off-screen narrator felt like it was quite infused with the author herself. And the reason I'm mentioning that is um, the other Sichuan book I've read in my life, a uh, translated Chinese Sichuan book, is um, Leave Me Alone by Murong Shui Sun. Have, have you read that one? Uh, I've read a bit of it. I've got a copy. Yeah, because um, in, in that one, the narrator is first person and the narrator is the the shit he's um is he married yes he is married he doesn't have kids but um he's a very similar kind of scumbag to shen chang he he eats a lot he drinks a lot he's in business and he womanizes Mm. a lot and you do wonder how much is this well i suppose it's a bit of an unfair thought but you you wonder is this guy an author insert by Mu Rong? Is he like this? Is he not? But of course, in the case of the Chili Bean Pace Clan, he the, the main character can't be an author insert, unless Yang Go has lived this life. But that seems really unlikely. Well, she she um ah, there. Are, it's very hard for me to say exactly what Yang Go feels about the kind of environment that she lived in when she was living. Yeah. In Sichuan, because it was her experiences as a young woman, but. You know, she said a few things and she's written a few things. One of the most amusing things she said was that when her father, her own father, her mm. own, uh, read the copy in the Chinese version, he was really upset because he said, everyone's going to think that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but he was pleased with the story when, when, it, when it finally came out. The other thing that Yen Go has talked about uh, is just what it's like living with some of these badly behaved, mm, morally corrupt men Yeah. Um, as a young writer. And so mm. she said things like she used to get wheeled out as the token young female writer at some of these occasions which are described, although Sheng Qiang, dad in the novel, is not a writer, He's a businessman. But some of these overindulgent dinners with lots of drinking and lots of hostesses. Right. Um, she used to be wheeled out to those as, as the token young female writer. And she felt she just didn't like it. She felt acutely embarrassed at times. Um, sometimes she used to get given a hostess herself to sit beside her. Mm. So I think she went through some fairly hair-raising experiences. And um, she's written a bit about that. So, yeah. So, okay. so what kind of person is, is dad? I think there are lots of dads around in Sichuan, people like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, in, in the last episode, I was asking some questions on a similar theme to Christopher Payne about Guo Sun Xian in... Um, in Empires of Dust. And I was wondering if this is an archetypal character in um, in modern Chinese literature, a middle-aged or older guy who's um, kind of fallen down the, the moral black hole. Um, 
if it's someone that crops up a lot in, in, in these types of novels? I think it probably does. And if it's not a middle-aged man behaving badly, it's a young man behaving badly. But right. I, that actually wasn't the reason why I like the novel. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I think the novel is brilliant is that Dad is shown as a, a many-sided character. He does yeah. hard to, and we've been so nasty about him already. <laughs> it's actually hard to believe. He's really very loyal to his overbearing mother. Mm -hmm. He loves his elder sister and respects her. He's moderately nice to his more or less long-term girlfriend who actually screws him over, which in itself is quite funny. Yeah. Um, and so he's a, he's a, a multi-layered character. He's not like, I think sometimes I find that Chinese fiction can have an awful lot of badly behaved characters in them, usually male. And usually to do with overindulgence in food, sex, or whatever. But he's a bit different. And, yeah. and it's really worth looking at the other sides, the way she presents him somewhat sympathetically. And I think if you get a rounded character like that, it's, it's, it's really good writing. Yeah, I think a, a big difference between him and Guo Sun Xian in Empires of Dust is, although he's not very consistent, he's definitely quite capable of feeling guilt yes yeah and I, I also one of the bits about the novel that really moved me was after they apart from sis the elder sister uh dad's elder sister mm -hmm. they all behave pretty badly at various times like uncle gran uh. mum, and so on but when you get to the end there is a kind of um making peace and it's all done through dad who nearly dies of a heart attack thinking that he's going to die and then and then there's the last few pages it's kind of looking forward to the future where mm. all of them have to come to terms with physical or emotional limitations constraints and reform their lives to a small degree in one way or another. And also, of course, they're not so burdened by the end because all their secrets have come out. Yeah. Uh, except possibly for one of Gran's secrets, which I think we have to dig quite deep um, to get at. And I'm not sure that Dad ever understands that, that final secret that Gran has. And I do hope the readers get it. And I think I'm not going to give things away, but I'm just going to say that when Dad is having his heart attack, um, Gran is sitting around the corner in the bushes feeling mortified because at her birthday celebrations some mm, interfering old so-and-so who's connected to her, who's uh, the cousin of her, um, Shufu, the mm. master chili bean paste maker. Yes. Therefore Gran's chief employee in the factory. Um, they're having a quiet chat around the corner because the um, uh, the banner, the birthday banners done by the Shrupals, uh, this employee's uh, cousin, apparently give away Gran's long hidden, hidden secret. Gran feels they, that the secret has been given away by this extraordinary bit of gobbledygook. No one else gets it. Mm. Gran thinks she's been betrayed. And so she rushes away thinking... Her secret's been discovered. And I think I'd like readers to read that conversation between Gran and the Shrufu very carefully and see if they can understand what that secret is too. It's actually not that difficult. Just don't read it too fast. Uh -huh. That's um, a handy tip for the listeners. That's the kind of thing I think that would shine more and more on rereads. And I, I do think this is a pretty rereadable book. Mm -hmm. Quite punchy, not too long. And yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> So I'll probably move on to the next thematic question. It's another comparison question, and I'm I'm not expecting yourself or even anyone to really know the answer to this one. But I remember reading somewhere, I, I don't remember where, maybe some online review, that um, the Chinese title of this book, Woman Jia, Our Family, is maybe an allusion to another book, an older book, also set in Sichuan, uh, Jia, by Ba Jin, or I think in some English versions he's called Pa Chin, uh, so Jia just being family. 
Mm. So can you can but bearing in mind that I don't necessarily expect you to know the absolute answer on this, do you, can you confirm or deny that woman Jia might be an illusion or a successor to Jia? I, I think it must be. Yeah, I think, in fact, I remember Yen Go saying that at one point, that um, it was a reference. But also the very interesting man, um, editor and arts curator owning who introduced me to Yen Go. That was the first thing he said to me. He asked me to translate a sample chapter for his magazine, uh, Tiannan Hutspa, in English. Mm. Uh, and he said, Woman uh, Jia, it's a reference, it's a deliberate allusion to Ba Jin's Jia family. I haven't actually read Ba Jin's Jia family, but uh, I do think this is Woman Jia, our family, the Chili Bean Pace clan in English. It's such a brilliant portrayal of, of family squabbles and relationships. So I actually, I, I kind of feel I ought to go and read Ba Jin's book mm -hmm. and, and see how, how it's similar, how it's, how it's different. Yen Go is extremely well read, so I wouldn't be at all surprised if I find a number of similarities. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I have a copy of um, Jia a really interesting copy um because it's got it's got prefaces from previous editions in it all kind of onion layer within one another um so it seems like a book if you were taking a semi academic interest in it like that there could be a lot to dig up but um yeah i've i've not read it either so got no light to shed on this question but thank you for your answer um as i said yen go is very well read there are lots of classical allusions as well mm. For instance, in the Terrible Birthday banner, I just couldn't do the classical illusions. I could yeah. do lots of the innuendo. So it actually came out rather ruder in the English, according to Yen Go, than the Chinese, where the innuendo is <laughs> mitigated by these slightly attenuated by these extraordinary classical illusions that I simply mm. I couldn't cope with in the translation. Right. I normally ask these more technical translation questions in the middle um, of, of, of the episode or the interview, but did you feel tempted at all to footnote this book? Because I seem to recall there's absolutely no explanatory footnotes in it. I didn't really. I think I felt that the translation had to, had to stand on its own feet. Yeah. Um, I mean... Suppose I had gone into great detail about how I translated the swear words and the discussions that Yen Go and I had about swear words and so on, or the local dialect. I'm not sure it would have added anything for the reader. No. Um, the only thing I would have been tempted to write up was uh, an explanation, a clearer explanation of the denouement, which I think people have to read quite carefully to um see all the things that have been going on but of course I couldn't do that because that's the plot spoiler and Yen Go yeah. writes deliberately uh, in allusions and you, you have to work hard so so I couldn't give away the plot either no. so no as far as the language went I mean you could write a thesis about it but I don't think that footnotes would really have added much to your experience of reading the translation yeah, I definitely think uh, the the language and the translation spoke for itself. Um, I never, I was never left scratching my head, unless, of course, it was a deliberate mystery in the story. <laughs> um, so you mentioned earlier about Yanga being kind of wheeled out at literary events, um, and I, I've I've seemed to have gleaned from reading up on this novel that she's a kind of a rising star and this book is kind of a sign of her rising star so how if i know this is a bit of a big vague question again you, you couldn't really be expected to have the perfect ready-made answer but um how would you say um the book or the author fits into the landscape of modern chinese fiction uh right yes i thought that was a very interesting question to me it's the way Yenge talks about small town life mm. while making it while giving it a kind of universal appeal i mean the the i think this is quite rare in chinese fiction 
Uh, we already talked a bit about the fact that it's not just men behaving badly or or young men behaving badly. Yeah. Um, so it is fairly, really quite multi-layered. Um, I think that the atmosphere of the small town is really fun and really interesting. There's lots of local colour. Yeah. But yeah. also the... Uh, the the humour, the the way the character. I I think that the depth of of some of the characters is quite unusual. Mm. Uh, the characters are rounded. We can empathise with them. I feel especially that we we empathise with, for example, Uncle, even though he's a bit of a wet blanket sometimes, mm-hmm. and is the older the the older sister. So yeah. I think the way she portrays the characters, but the way she sets them in the local in a local context, I mean, it's wonderful the way these squabbling middle-aged siblings squabble <laughs> all the way through. And if anyone has actually, we've all had experience of families where the 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 elders, the sisters and brothers who are now middle-aged, they just carry on the way they used to carry on when they were six, seven, and eight years. Mm-hmm. And and this is so funny, and I just love that. Uh, so, I did, I did think this was brilliantly universal, as well as being set in a a colourful local context. Absolutely. Um, I have on my dad's side of the family, we have a holiday every year where the extended family all kind of well, provided no one can't make it, um, but the extended family all converge in one place for the Easter holidays. And we have um we have a grandma who's the matriarch, and then, mm-hmm. but the 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 leadership is kind of maybe a third or fifty percent her, and then the other half, it's all her middle aged children and their um their spouses forming this kind of council of quite similar but mismatched people all negotiating with one another, and yeah. it's not a million miles away from the siblings in the Chili Bean Pace clan at all. It seems yeah. quite universal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a sign of a good book, isn't it? You can empathise with what they're saying because even if you've never been to a small town in Sichuan, you certainly know older aunts and uncles who never stop getting at each other the way they always used to. Mm -hmm. Except they've got the burden of responsibility that they wouldn't have had when they were wee kids. Yes, yeah, yeah. And the secrets still rankle, that's the thing. And the secrets have evolved over the years. Yeah, just they just kind of pickle over time. Yeah. Um, so following up on that last question, do you think the way this book, the translated book, fits into the translated Chinese fiction market is, does it play a similar role to how it does in its uh, domestic literary landscape, or is it a little bit more special? I think that's quite a hard question to answer. Yeah. Uh, and the reason is not. The reason I say that is not because of the book itself. It's because Chinese fiction as a whole is so little known. Right. Um, in English translation, that people, I think often when they pick up a Chinese novel, have a problem putting it in context. I mean, you can pick up a Scandinavian crime novel. You can pick up now a translation of a Latin American magical realist novel. and. Yeah. Kind of know what you're going to get. Um, right. It's quite a new for most people. It's quite a new experience to pick up a uh, a Chinese novel because unless they're getting something which is all about the miseries of the Cultural Revolution, they they they're constantly being confronted by the fact that China is a complicated place. Oh yes. So they have to keep an open mind, and I do hope that's what readers will do: they keep an open mind understand that China is a very complicated place, uh, multiple shades of, of grey, black and white. Mm. And you if you if you if you just think about what you're reading, you realise that actually people in China are pretty much like people anywhere, just in a slightly different place. Uh, I mean one of the things which comes out of the book uh, I suppose, is the appalling sexism. So it relates a bit to the Me Too movement. And mm-hmm. that has happened 
since the book was written. So the book was not written in response to the Me Too movement. Um, and even when I was translating it, Me Too hadn't arrived on the scene. Right. Uh, so that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's very interesting that it's written by a young woman writer. And Yen Go was in her mid-twenties when she wrote it, which to me is one of the more remarkable mm -hmm. achievements of the book. Yeah, that's my age. Yeah, she's writing about much older people in a way mm -hmm. which is very subtle and nuanced. Yeah. Uh, how readers will read it, well, that certainly depends what's inside the reader's head. Uh, I mean, a lot of people expect to see a misery memoir when they pick up a book about China. Yes, definitely. Sexism, political repression, censorship are all the kind of tropes that they expect to um, come up against. But I think if they read this book, they'll find that actually it, it's so universal and uh, so funny. Yeah, I think it would make a great entry point to, um, I, I, it's not the genre, but to books from China. My, my own entry was very easy because I was already living there. And I the, the first real translated piece of fiction I read all the way through was, it was Liu Cixin's Three Body Problem. So mm -hmm. there wasn't, it wasn't too tricky of having to know the context of the literary landscape because it was a genre book. And I mm -hmm. already knew what to expect from sci-fi, you know, broadly speaking. Yeah. Yeah, well, that the, I mean, that's a wonderful thing about genre fiction, that you do slightly know what you're going to get. So yeah. prime sci-fi, particular Chinese sci-fi, <laughs> and has become very popular in translation. So this, this is a bit different, because this is not a genre book. It's not, not at all, no. It's not crime. It's, it's just a great novel. So yeah. you have to approach it with an open mind. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking about trying to put it in categories or a context um so the english edition is a nice kind of warm red color it's got chili in its name the, is the illustration on it a chili bean <laughs> i don't know uh i think various people have looked at that illustration and drawn their own conclusions i didn't do the illustration <laughs> no <laughs> Even, i i think it's i think it's great i'm not going to tell you what i think it is I didn't. Okay. I, um, you know what? Now that you say that, I'm seeing things I wasn't seeing before. Well, exactly. Yes, it's it's the, one of the nice things about books. You can let your imagination run right. Yes. I did really think of the title, the Chili Bean Paste Clan. That was Anna Homewood, who was then working for um, Greyhawk Agency. All oh, right. Okay. Agents for Yenge, and she thought of the title, the Chili Bean Paste Clan. And I think we just, when I started to translate it, there was no question about it. It was just a great title. Mm. So, for, for listeners who are wondering if the name Anna Holmwood rings a bell, she was the translator of, um, why have I forgotten the name? That's terrible. IE's book, The Perfect Crime. A Perfect Crime, yes. Yeah, a Perfect Crime, yeah. So we, we're already fans of her on the show. Um, so where I was going with that question was... Um, it seems like there's a fair bit of spiciness on the cover and, and the title. And spiciness is kind of goes hand in hand with Sichuan, or at least what Westerners might associate with the word Sichuan. And it reminded me a little bit, um, that book I mentioned before, Leave Me Alone, mm. pushes itself not super hard, but fairly hard as, as a novel of Chengdu. So do you think it's helpful for readers to think of this as a Sichuan book, or would you prefer them to, or is that just too much of an expectation for people who maybe haven't even heard the word before? Well, um, I mean, because li living in London uh, part of the time, Sichuan, I often go to Sichuan restaurants, and mm. other people will read the book who've never been to a Sichuan restaurant. I think... If you haven't eaten Sichuan food, which after all is a big part of the atmosphere of the book, yeah. because Dad, Dad loves his food and he also has this great nostalgia for uh, childhood snacks and local snacks um, mm -hmm. and local food, um, which is very, I think, very common now in, in China. So yeah. I, th I think that if you've had Sichuan food, 
yes, you know exactly what is being described. But even if you haven't, it doesn't really matter because what you get from the descriptions of the food is this huge affection and nostalgia for childhood uh, experiences. Mm. One of the things that Dad is always lamenting is that this small town has changed from being a small town. It's gone it's, up market, right? Uh, it's gone up market, it's become developed, and a lot of the old snack stalls don't exist anymore. And he comes mm-hmm. up at the wonders of eating this um, uh, chilled rabbit. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was just lovely. And I, I think you, anyone who's traveling in China who talks to Chinese people will find that an affection for, an interest in, in local food, especially food that people have had when they're kids, it's very developed. And yes. And love their food. Um, and there's, it's quite interesting that there's also now a growing interest in well-grown organic foods and a commensurate fear of contaminated cheap food, uh, cheap plants. Yep. So... Food is such an important part of Chinese culture and so such an important part of people's feeling of well-being or the opposite. So dad is really, truly happy when he's sitting, eating something that he's had when he was a kid. And, mm. you know, that's, that's part of when he's at peace with himself, it's because he's eating something that takes him back to his childhood. Yeah, the bit that is burned if you'll pardon the pun in my memory is when he's looking with his brother i think it's with his brother quite frantically for a spite a particular spicy dumpling shop which yeah. is yeah if i remember right it's pretty down and gritty dirty place but that's part of the appeal mm. but yeah um and again it's a spicy dumpling so it's something that like i remember a few times in Shanghai, fixatedly looking for just that kind of dumpling shop, but it they wouldn't be of it. They wouldn't have spicy offerings. Yeah, and that's part of their making peace with each other. These two warring brothers. Who, mm. It turns out at the end have fallen out very early on due to uh, actually misunderstandings, a whole series of misunderstandings. But that part of them making peace with each other is going to have a dumpling meal. As you do, yeah. Um, so you talked a bit before about really enjoying the, the middle-aged sibling bickering. I wonder, do you have a favourite um, argument between these siblings or in-laws that stands out for you? Yes, there, there's um, there's a favourite incident where they're all having a huge row at Gran's party. I think Gran uh, has already rushed out of the room because she reckons she's been rumbled with the uh, birthday banners. She reckons that the birthday banners have given away a long-kept secret. Um, And so inside the room, there's um, uncle, dad's mother, Mm. turns up with his new girlfriend. And a huge row erupts. And it is really funny because of who the girlfriend is and the way the other people in in the room know her through completely different connection and what on earth is she doing there why is she being brought to this 80th birthday party grand's 80th birthday party i think that is is really lovely um mm. and uh, i already talked a bit about grand's reaction to the terrible birthday banners actually can i slightly digress a bit and tell Please. you how much fun it was translating the birthday banner I Absolutely. said that they they were full of classical allusions and mm-hmm. I translated them right at the beginning of my translation. When I got to the end and they had to be kind of wheeled out as part of this denouement, I looked at them again and I thought, I've got classical allusions. I've got to make mm-hmm. them fine. There's a reference to Gran's given name. All throughout the novel, she's known as Gran, but she does actually have a given name, uh, what we would call a Christian name. Yeah. Then there's the name of the factory, um, which, again, recurs through the, the whole novel. Then there's got to be the innuendo, the reference to Gran. All right, I'll just give away a little bit of the secret. Gran <laughs> an affair. 
Yes. Um, and I thought, how am I going to get this into these four lines? And I thought and thought about it, and Yen Ge and I discussed it because, you know, she was quite keen. She, she also realised that these four lines are absolutely crucial. Yes. Um, and she asked another friend of hers in Chengdu, who is uh, Irish, actually. And we had right. discussions. And then I came back with something completely different. I got everything in, except for the classical illusions. And in fact, what I did was, um, I'm going to read it to you in a minute, but um, I chose a completely different name for Gran, just because I could get a rhyme in. Then oh, I chose a completely different name for the factory, because that way I could relate the factory name to Gran's name. Because in the actual Chinese, her name was related to the name of the factory. So I could get that connection in. Right. Then I just let rip with the innuendo. And some people will recognize that there is a classical illusion that in some classical pornographic novels in Chinese, uh, a certain part uh, of the body is referred to in that way. And then I made it rhyme. And then I sat back and I thought, I do hope Yen Ge likes this. Anyway, I think she, um, she did like it in the end. So, so this is the birthday banner. Okay. Which sets grand so much. Long life to our distinguished Madam May. As we celebrate her 80th birthday. Long life to the Mayflower factory where the fragrant vats embrace the stalk of longevity. So you can sit and think about that for quite some time. But oh, yeah. I had so much fun doing this. And uh, th th so it's actually got, although it hasn't faithfully followed the Chinese, it's got all the connections that the Chinese had. It's got the connections in, in the English as well. And that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I love it. Yeah. And it's got some rereadability and some depth for. So you, I mean, you could you could read over it once and enjoy enjoy just the feel of the words. But for people who are looking for a bit more, or for people who are nerdy or obsessed with the book, you've you've left a little gem for them there. <laughs> yeah. Then I had to go back right to the beginning of the book and change every occurrence of Gran's name and the factory name so it matched up with the, the names on the birthday banner. What was her name in the original? Do you remember? Oh, I can't remember. Some oh. flower, rather. <laughs> One of the flowers. Fair enough. I took it up for you, but uh, I'm afraid now, to my mind, she's become May. That's it. Oh, for any bilingual listeners, that will be another fun thing for them to do, should they choose. Go and look for the original name. Yeah. Um, as soon as I become bilingual, I'll do that in about a million years. Um so, yeah, jumping back a wee bit to asking you about the uh, siblings bickering, one thing I remember quite strongly is that probably, I, I didn't do a word count, but for every spoken argument, we get quite a lot of, we're privy to quite a lot of the rants in Shen Chang's dad's heads. And I thought those were some of the funniest things because some of them were so petty. Uh, did you enjoy those or enjoy translating those? Uh very much, yeah. I'm just looking for when I thought of some. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, poor Shen Chiang. He and his brother. His brother is an is an uh, older brother. Um, favored his whole life by by Gran. Because, yeah. Um, because he has this withered hand, and Gran's worried that. With a withered hand, he'll never find a bride. So she keeps trying to protect this lad. Um, but because he's constantly favoured, there's sibling rivalry. Poor old Shen Qiang reckons that he's he's always getting put down. He's always getting the blame. Yeah. And the funniest thing is that when he goes to lose his virginity to the local prostitute, he discovers to his horror that the prostitute knows his brother very well indeed yes and so he didn't even he can't even go to the local prostitute without learning that his brother got there first and there's all sorts of things like that but um yeah he's constantly ranting and, and one of the things i had to figure out was whether to put it all in italics whether to <coughs> how to show that this was an internal rant right. because 
very important that we don't think he's speaking this aloud. It is actually what's going on in his head. Mm -hmm. So that, and it is basically Shun Chiang who's doing that. There's really no one else in the novel who has these angry rants. It's but it's it's Shun Chiang. Yeah, definitely got at least a chip on his shoulder. Um, yeah. So last last question is about the story itself. Uh, two quite subjective questions. Um, we've kind of gone into this first one a wee bit before, and there may not actually be an answer. Depends what you think people are made of. But um, at his core, what kind of person do you think uh, Shen Chang is? Uh, well, that's actually quite a hard question to yeah. answer because Yenga, in a way, makes makes us sympathise with him. Makes him a uh, makes him sound. I mean, she she does show his nice side, which means that we sometimes can pass over quite how gross he is. And I think it's worth remembering quite what a an unpleasant philanderer he is. I mean, how he punished his wife when she had one brief affair where mm. he, his entire life has been carry on going. Even after his marriage, marriage, he carried on going to the local prostitutes. This is a small town, so everybody knew that he was going to the local prostitutes. So mm. that was the thing that mum, his wife, had to live with. And um, I think... Yeah, I, I think we have to kind of, I had to keep telling myself, look, he really does behave pretty badly because Yango has drawn him with a, with a very light touch. So he's, he's pretty bad. But on the other hand, I guess we forgive him because mum forgives him, because his daughter forgives him. Because his brother and his sister forgive him. He does get a lot of kind of passes, even his wife goes quite yeah. easy on him <laughs> yes but then 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 we see that actually he's the only one who's looked after his really totally horrible mother <laughs> um, so you have to forgive him in a way mm. because of that okay and another question about the family um which character would you most want to eat some hot pot with oh i think mum yeah you'd have so much gossip <laughs> she knows that town inside out and uh, she'd be so much fun to have hot pot with and she's a fighter mm -hmm. yeah yeah she wouldn't cut you any slack if she thought you were wrong about something yeah okay well with that last wee question about the story aside i'm going to ask you some translation -y related questions um so there's a word i learned in my during writing my dissertation, uh, paratext, so all the stuff in a book that's not the story itself. Um, and I noticed that the the two big paratexts in this one um, are Yang Yanga's little author's note at the start, and then so before the story, and then after the end of the story comes your little translator's note. Uh, I think that's quite a good setup. Um, would you would you agree that's a good way to order an author's and a translator's note? Oh, yes. Um, that's quite difficult. I think if I thought more about it, I might have recommended it the other, doing it the other way around. Oh, OK. Just because I think that once you've read the novel, you know, you can appreciate so much more how Yen goes describing how she wrote it. Mm. Um. And I didn't really think of it, but you've always got to think of these things from the point of view of the reader coming yeah. to something quite new and strange. I mean, it doesn't matter because if people don't read the forward until they've finished, so be it. If they yeah. decide to read the afterward at the beginning or not at all, again, that's fine. They're just there for the reader to dip into and out That's of. true. Yeah, actually, now I think about it. I don't think I really started paying attention to, to these things until I got into um, these translated Chinese books because often there's a lot more or there's some interesting points in either the author or translator's note that just wouldn't exist in a non-translated book. Yeah. But yeah, before I had this niche interest, I often did just skip over these things. They seemed like a waste of time. Yeah, well, you know, I, I don't necessarily always read forwards or afterwards. Mm. Um, 
kind of depends. But uh, we both enjoyed writing. I think it's good that we put them both in. Yeah. I do think it it's um it's a nice it's nice that you're from what I remember about your translator's note, it's all just technical points about the translation work itself. Cause I've seen at least one translator's note right at the start of the story that tries to like philosophize about the story itself. And it felt I don't know, it felt a little bit beside the point to me. So I think it was nice that it was just kind of practical stuff. I'm very much a hands-on practical translator. I actually feel quite uncomfortable being asked to interpret the story. So um, you're not very likely to get that from me anyway. Mm. I mean, I like a bit, a little bit of philosophizing, but I, I think it is a bit, a bit sensitive when it's, um, it's such, I don't know, sounds a cheesy thing to say, but, or a reductive thing to say, but, so, you know, two very different and sometimes supposedly opposed cultures i think it does it is good to be a bit sensitive about these things yeah yeah i what i really like doing uh is writing blogs and mm. online, online stuff in literary online literary magazines i love writing about the work that i've done i mean i work in i i work on um i write for asian books blog blog every month and that gives me a chance to write about the kind of translations I've done, and and I love that. Um, that I find comes quite easily to me, especially if I've just finished a book. I can write about it. How much fun it was to translate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's good PR for the book and for the publisher and for the author. Everyone's a winner. Indeed, yes. Yeah. So speaking of authors and translators, um, so I think you mentioned before about working with Yanga on the the banner. And I, I think in other discussion about this book that you've taken part in online, there was, and I think in the translator's note, if I remember right, there's quite a bit of, you've talked about quite a bit of collaboration with Yanga, the author herself. Um, is, is that more or less right? Yes. Uh, I translated it. At that time, I didn't know Yanga. And mm. I showed her the complete draft because she'd been in the States. Her English is very good. In fact, she's now actually writing in English. Um, and she went through it with a fine tooth comb and it must have driven her absolutely mad. I hadn't quite realised how much of the dialect um, I'd missed quite a few. I simply hadn't understood some of the dialect. And in fact, she, she said herself, that a lot of her friends reading it couldn't understand the dialect. I'm talking about Chinese friends. They also couldn't understand the dialect. The dialect she uses is very much the dialect of that small town. So even if you came from Chengdu, you couldn't necessarily understand the right. dialect that she writes in. So we had long discussions, <clears throat> the dialect, the swear words. Uh, one of the problems is that English does not have a lot of colourful ways of swearing, at least not quite as colourful as, as these dialect, uh, Chinese dialect Mm -hmm. swear words so we had quite a lot of fun dreaming up new and colorful swear words to put in so am, am i right in thinking this dialect is part of the Sichuanese dialect family tree but it's just far enough off the main branch that it's not well, universally understandable even by Sichuanese people some some words some expressions are very local to that particular town okay yeah, it's really interesting so using your um, newly learned uh, dialect, thanks to Yanga, can you teach the listeners a Sichuan or a is Pingla? Is it, should I be saying Pingla dialect? Is that right? Or uh, Well, um, yes, if I say it's Pingla dialect, so you probably get some listeners saying that actually it also is um, um, used all over Sichuan. Let's say Sichuan dialect. Yes. Okay. It's ever so rude. How rude do you want me to be? Um, uh, it's all rude. I can't, yeah. I can't actually choose one. Oh, well, I can tell you one which is relatively innocuous and caused us quite a lot of heartache. Uh, Shen Jiang Dad, that is, mm -hmm. refers to women somewhat derogatively all the way through as Horn Yang. Born young, and we and and 
Yengar said, how have you translated Pornyang? I can't see it anywhere. And I said, I know it's a derogatory way of referring to a woman. However, I can't use words like slut, slag, bitch, cow. They would all be too strong. Yeah. This word occurs, you know, 150 times all through the novel. So I had to kind of get that dismissive way of referring to women or girls in another way, like that woman or that girl, or sometimes uh, if I think that she might have, he, he might have referred to a woman in English as bitch, then I'd use witch or silly cow or a stupid woman. Right, so, so it wasn't always the same word you translated exactly. it to. I just had to ring the changes to get the impression through the novel that he's he's using not very complimentary words to refer to women and girls the mm. whole time. Well, it um, wouldn't fit at all, but what about wench? Uh, wench, I actually would have been perfect, but just too old-fashioned in English. Yeah. Oh, it would have been, wench would have been perfect if I'd been writing 300 years ago or translating 300 years ago. Alas. <laughs> Alas. <laughs> But there are some very funny swear words. I mean, mm. uh, I've written a very funny note to myself here. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, you can cut this out if you think it's too rude. Okay. So, no, but one way in which dad refers to his brother is uh, my peer. My peer. My I, peer. I it okay. and it's, it's pretty obvious. Pigou de peer. All right. It's, uh, a man who sells his ass, so he's an asshole. Who's ah. a and I have this footnote to myself. It goes, douchebag. A douchebag, I must have got this from somewhere online, is someone who has surpassed the levels of jerk and asshole, however not yet reached fucker or motherfucker. <laughs> so my peer became a douchebag. I still don't know quite know what a douchebag is but never mind it sounds great it works if, if i was going to niggle slightly it's a it's a, i think it's one of these slang douchebag i mean not my peer it's started out as a little bit of an americanism and then found its way over like it was a word that I, was a popular I, one when I, I was in high school yeah absolutely i plundered americanisms you know you got to there just aren't enough swear words in british english yeah at least not in standard british english Mm -hmm. um, and there were some extraordinary ones. There's another which basically means prick, jerk, dickhead, tradeser, hammer. Tradeser. How on earth does hammer come to mean oh. a, a rude way of referring? Well, anyway. Uh, I get it's like a bit blunt, a bit crude, but. Yeah. Mm. So um, we did do a lot of discussion, and, and I, I felt the sad lack of colourful slang in English. So. I had to ask my friends, my son, my daughter. I looked at urban slang online, which is actually a lot, um, a lot of Americanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's let's use the Americanisms if they're cultural enough. Yeah, plenty of them are very good. I guess that would be a good um, conversation point, talking to people who translate from other languages, doing a little compare and contrast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can find some very funny blog posts by translators about translating uh, slang and swearing in different languages, uh, right. especially the Latin languages, the languages where Catholicism gives you a whole load of different <laughs> swear words. Right. Uh, passionate Mediterraneans, that's the stereotype, right? Uh, well, it's not that, no, I'm not going to go there because actually... No. Don't, I, I don't do enough translating or any translating from Spanish or Italian. But uh, according to translators from Latin languages, they have quite a lot of problems finding mm. uh, some words that will fit in English. Okay, so putting all the cursing behind us, another, another little uh, vocab question. I remember, maybe it was just because I was looking at a lot of menus, but... In my time in China, some of the vocab I picked up most quickly was um, food. Maybe again, because there's a fairly smallish set of recurring characters you need to learn. But um, anyway, could could you teach us some Sichuan food vocab, if you have any to hand? Um, not really. And I tell you, I feel no. 
Paris that I can't really read it. I can't really say it in 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 a Sichuan accent. Oh, of course. Uh, and and actually, in all the translating I've done of local food, and heaven knows every novel has local food in it. Mm-hmm. I have this thing: if I if I translate it, am I giving the reader the right impression? If I transliterate it in Pinyin, how on earth do they know what I'm talking about? Or do I gloss it and call it spicy dumplings, for instance? So food, much as well, I love reading and writing about and um, Chinese food and consuming it, it's actually really difficult to mm. translate. I remember just on, on Twitter, uh, I saw uh, it was a tweet from the China Daily or one of the other um, or one of the big Chinese state news agencies, Twitter accounts. They were announcing that some Chinese dish, I don't remember the one, but a common one had been given a quote unquote official English name. And it was like five or six words and it was all very formal language. And I just was just shaking my head at it thinking, if you're going to give a dish an official name, like you've 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 messed it up badly. But um, <laughs> it's a bit of a rubbish story because I don't remember what the dish was. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, I understand the difficulty there. Uh, do you have a favourite Sichuan food? To ask a less academic question. Oh, just about anything. I mean, mm. I love hot pot. We did. My my husband is a, doesn't know any Chinese, but he's a really good cook of. Oh. Sichuan cookery. In fact, a lot of Chinese friends have visited us and, and had his meals, and they're always completely blown away by them. Anyway, he's he's made a little table stand for doing hot pot at home, so we do that on the table. Uh, probably pretty dangerous because you really <laughs> not want to tip that boiling oil and broth over on top of someone, but it's so good. Mapo dofu. Mm-hmm. Um, pot mark, mother bean curd. Uh, I mean, I totally recommend Fuchsia, any of Fuchsia Dunlop books with recipes in, uh, or any good Sichuan restaurant that you can find near where you are. Mm-hmm. I can say to any listeners who follow the podcast Instagram account, that account follows Fuchsia Dunlop's Instagram, and there's lots of saliva inducing pictures on her Instagram. It's it's actually I shouldn't look at it. It, um, it hurts me a bit. <laughs> <laughs> makes you sorry that you're not back exactly yeah um your your story about having a little stand for hot pot in your kitchen reminded me i knew some chinese people young young uh chinese people living in shanghai who had found a delivery what was it called Ul- ulama the food delivery app they'd found a store that sold through or a deliverer that sold through ulama where the quaidi the guy would drive up to your um flat or whatever and he would bring a little portable hot pot stand and all the ingredients and he'd make your hot pot and then I don't know if it was the next I think the next morning the quaidi would come back and collect the stand and the pot and you'd be <laughs> that's a great idea <laughs> yeah a genius and it, it it doesn't end up with the pot going in the bin so mm. it's greenish uh, but right yes. um there is a question here about the uh, English edition's title, but we've discussed that, so I'll skip it. Um, okay, this is a very trivial question. It's like my one my one niggle about the translation when I was reading the book, and it's probably just down to my own stupidity. Um, so Pingla, the name of the town in the yeah. book, it's rendered in italics. Is that right? Is it in italics or not? Uh, no, but it's all one word. Yes. So it's not okay. Pingla, it's... And I know what you're going to say. It looks yeah, like yeah. Pingle. Pingle looks like somewhere I, in the south of England. I love that. As soon as I saw it, I thought, you know, Pinyin is, the way Chinese is Romanized is actually so difficult to to enjoy when you're reading. The very mm-hmm. fact that the name of the town looks like Pingle, I think is great. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. So I love it. So I was, um, I was very pleased that... Shut the door. Uh, I was very pleased it looked that the long live Pingle Town. Yeah, fair enough. I suppose. I suppose it's a it's a case of death of the offer comes on a bit strong. But if readers read it that way, you know yeah. what harm is done? None at all, really. Yeah. Um. Okay. 
that's a cheerful answer to that question. Um, so another thing you touched on earlier, and I don't know how much you know, and you're, I wouldn't, I don't think you should be expected to be Yanga's representative um, at all. But I've heard that she's, you've mentioned, and I've heard that she's planning to do more writing in English. Do you know anything more about that or the nature of what she's thinking about writing in English? Um, yes, Yenga is, is um, she's now resident in the UK, so she's very much very capable of representing herself. But I've noticed that she's actually getting on really well writing short stories in English and has had uh, short stories published in a couple of anthologies. So, and I've also read uh, short stories which she had published in the Irish Times when she was living in Dublin. So um, she's uh, done quite a lot of work writing in English, but uh, I think she's told me that she, it doesn't mean she'll never go back to writing in Chinese. I mean, the great thing is she can write in both languages and she writes rather different things in different languages. Mm. Do you think we're going to see more um, authors like her as kind of the number of people speaking English in China goes up and their the overall kind of average level goes up as well? Uh, what, writing in English? Or, or more, more Chinese authors who are bilingual or speak English as well as Chinese very, to a high level? I don't know. At the moment, very few authors seem to have fluent English. Uh, and in fact, one of the jobs that a translator has to do often is to kind of mediate between the author and the publisher, mm. if the publisher in the West doesn't have any Chinese speaker. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It will be interesting to see, especially the younger ones whose English really is very good. Yeah, I have. I did notice when I was doing my dissertation on sci-fi that so that there are more young authors like Yanga writing in Chinese sci-fi and quite a few of them have very good, good, or at least some English. And it does seem to facilitate a wee bit more exchange than maybe older monolingual authors have. Yes, I, I think that's, I think that is really nice because that some of my favorite uh, older authors actually can't write the kind of blogs that I'm writing to mm who introduce their work to Western readers because they simply don't know enough about how Western readers receive their work. That's not the case with younger authors who've travelled a lot and are much more in tune with what uh, overseas readers will, uh, um, will find, uh, will need explaining or not need explaining, will, will understand over overseas readers much better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so that's all the technically translation -y questions I've got. Um, phase three is just some questions about yourself. Um, we, obviously, we, we touched on a few of those things at the start and through the course of our chat. So um, let's just try and build on that. Uh, some of the listeners might know already, but how did you uh, first kind of connect or become interested um, with China? In, or in China, I've, I phrased that strangely. Yeah. Well, I, I decided to do my degree in Chinese because I had uh, a member of my family thought that, you know, Chinese was the up-and-coming language. Oh. So it's in the middle of the Cultural Revolution. And right. the actual effect of this was that I spent four very happy years at Leeds University getting to know the north of England and mm. never at that point went to China. So I only went to China quite a bit after that. And then once I started going to China and I started translating, I go to China all the time. Um, and I've been a visiting scholar there at times. So my connection with China has grown over the years and I have a lot of Chinese friends. But mm -hmm. it's grown somewhat randomly, I'd say. It's not, I didn't follow an academic path. Mm, well, your, your relative who thought China was the up-and-coming thing, certainly had foresight. But I suppose, given that it's such a big country, it's a sensible, a sensible prediction to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, not a lot of people were saying that at that time. But anyway, right. I, never, I never regretted it. It was a mm -hmm. great choice. And um, another question about those maybe formative years. Uh, I asked this question to Christopher Payne as well. 
Uh, were there any pieces of Chinese literature that made a big kind of early impact on you? Uh, well, when we were studying Chinese, we started from scratch. So we hardly really mm. uh, even touched the edges of Chinese literature. Uh, the first novel that I translated was K, written by Hong Ying. So Hong Ying's work, I found really a very big eye-opener. And that was really what started me off. This was after I finished my degree. Right. Dropped my Chinese for a number of years, taken it back up again, relearned it, and then I started reading authors like Hong Ying and other authors. Uh, so I had quite a big period in the middle when I really wasn't reading and doing any Chinese at all. Mm. Uh, what's K about? I've not heard of it. Oh, it's a fictionalised account of Julian Bell, who is Vanessa Bell's son, who went to China and actually did have an affair with the wife of the dean of his university in uh, Wuhan. And uh, it's a fictionalised version of it. Uh, although it draws on Vanessa Bell and Virginia Woolf's letters and some of Julian Bell's letters as well. Julian Bell was then killed during the Spanish Civil War where he went to be an ambulance driver. Uh, yeah, so it's... Um, it was a fun novel to translate, and it was my first. And I was also very lucky that Hong Ying's then husband, Henry Zhao, was my mentor and looked at each chapter and provided some useful guidance. That's, um, that's really interesting. I'll have to, have to investigate that myself. Um, so I, another question I also asked Christopher Payne, um, do you think you've met any of the chili bean paste clan in real life? Not necessarily Chinese people, but anyone you've ever met at all. Have you ever met a, a gran? Or hopefully not, but have you met a dad? The, the thing is, it's very, it's very hard to say that. Um, I mean, I have a lot of uh, Latin American Chilean in-laws, but even there, I can't really relate that fairly extraordinary and dramatic family to this kind of family in right. the first novel. So, and of course, when I meet people in China, when I meet their, their parents and their relatives, they're all being very nice. I'm not really getting the inside story. So maybe I have, but maybe I wouldn't ever have known. Oh, that's, that is a good answer. Mm. Mm. Um, have you seen a lot or much of Sichuan itself because the only bit I've seen is Chengdu and that was at the end of a long trip and I really didn't get the most out of it didn't even that eat that much spicy food I, I love Sichuan I'd love to go back and travel more there I've been up Erme Shan I've been to Le Shan where the world's biggest uh, surviving Buddha statue is mm. I've been in Chengdu where I paid a couple of visits to uh the bar called the White Knight by Year Chila Bo uh, Club, which is uh, it's a kind of literary club and bar set up by the poet Jai Yongming, Ooh. who I really like her. I think she's a fantastic woman. Um, so I have been in Chongqing, but I not very much. Chengdu I love, and I was there this year. Fantastic. Um, no. You mentioned that um, Paper Republic's recently registered as a UK charity. So I guess this question would be a chance to expand on that or any future plans. Do you or any of the other, your colleagues who help out with Paper Republic, uh, have any big things in the works that you'd like to um, announce uh, or promote? Well, we're having, we're having a fundraising, we're having a big fundraising drive. Mm. Um, so we're, we're, and we're having a big, party in London at the end of November but um, now we've finally got ourselves registered got a bank account, got a PayPal account and so on. We really want to raise money so that we can work with other organisations and I think that because we're a fairly small organisation run by volunteers uh, we'll continue to do what we've done quite successfully in the past which is to find partners so the partners can be festivals, other literary magazines, um, 
any other like-minded people with whom we can share readers, share uh, so that we can open up what we're doing to the even bigger, wider world of, of readers and show them what's good about Chinese fiction in translation. I mean, it's great to piggyback on other organizations and they also can do the same for us. I mean, collaboration is the name of the game. Absolutely. Um, for listeners who'd like to help you raise funds, is there a place they can do that just yet or is that still in the works? Oh, no, they can. They can go to um, the Paper Republic website, which is paper-republic.org. Mm-hmm. Do you get the dot .org in? Because <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, you may get a stationary company trying to sell you envelopes. That's happened to me a few times. <laughs> it's not dot .com, it's dot .org. And there you will um, you find there's a PayPal button on the left. And even if you don't have a PayPal account uh, yourself, you can donate using your card. Or you can write to us and tell us what ideas you have and how you'd like to work with us. Okay, I'll make sure there's a link to that uh, section of the site in the show notes. But whenever, in, in all the recent episodes, when I need a reference to an author, like a little mini bio, I link the best place to usually go, especially for more niche authors, is Paper Republic. So I've been consistently oh, linking to you guys because you I'm are so pleased. You you're said. the number one, definitely. We are the number one. Yeah. Hell yes. Um, so last couple of questions. Um, what are you reading just now? And are there any books, uh, Chinese or otherwise, that you'd like to recommend to listeners to check out? Uh, right. This is where I get a complete mental blank. Oh, no. Okay. Tell you what I'm planning to read and I've started to read. I think that uh, Chinese women writers really get a very raw deal in translation. I'm not quite sure why that is. There are lots of wonderful women writers. So my plan for this year and in fact, I'm presenting a paper on women in translation on Chinese women writers at the Women in Translation Conference in London at the end of October. Mm -hmm. My plan is uh, to uh, read lots more Chinese women writers and try and pitch them to publishers. Uh, I did a really, really interesting questionnaire with uh, about 20 Chinese women writers who incredibly generously gave enough of their time to answer my questions about what it's like being a woman writer in China. Mm. And so that's my, um, my big project for this year. So I'd say, if you're a, a reader and want to read Chinese fiction, um, look for women writers. If you don't find them, look at Paper Republic. If you still don't find them, uh, contact me. And I think we really need to be promoting and pitching Mm. women writers because only a small proportion of writers translated into English from Chinese are actually women. Mm -hmm. I can uh, tag team with you on that one because, again, a thing that popped up in my dissertation about Chinese sci-fi is perhaps perhaps through who is succeeding in China itself, but I think also helped by the fact that the, the authors that Ken Leo has chosen to put in his um, sci-fi anthologies has brought some uh, some female Chinese sci-fi writers to the fore. Um, so the three big names that spring to my mind are Xia Jia, um, Hao Jin Fa. So Xia Jia, she's got stories in both the um, both the Ken Liu sci-fi anthologies, Invisible Planets and Broken Stars. And through Clark's World, she's got a collection of short stories coming that's called A Summer Beyond Your Reach. Mm-hmm. And then there's um, Hao Jing Fang. Ha, ha Jing Fang, yes, uh, the lady who wrote Folding Beijing. Yeah. Uh, who, who, as far as I'm aware, there's a couple of film adaptations of her work. One is Folding Beijing itself, and there's another one. I forget what it's an adaptation of, but we might be seeing some Hao Jing Fang movies on the way. I mean, and just, then. Uh, sorry, I just, I just I just interrupt for a moment because yeah, the writers that I interviewed, a couple of them. Uh, Tang Fei was another one. Yes, that was the third person I was about to say, Tang Fei. These are really on the ball young women writers, and mm. it's fascinating what they said about the kind of opportunities that writing sci-fi has offered them. 
And they're just fantastic examples of uh, much younger writers than I normally translate, but they, they are the future. And mm -hmm. they, they pointed out, uh, two of them actually pointed out separately in their answers to my questionnaire, that um, Chinese women writers are best known for writing short sci-fi work at the moment. Yes. I'll, yeah. say, I'll say, I'll rephrase that. Chinese women sci-fi writers are better known for the short fiction. And okay. the writers who are, are better known for writing long novels are like uh, Yeo Zixin, are, are men. Yeah. Uh, so I, in my little dissertation, I made a, a very rough two-column table trying to divide the uh, authors into two groups. And it's obviously very arbitrary in some ways, but there was it, the left column was hard sci-fi, um, older authors, male authors, long-form novels, and the other column was soft sci-fi, mostly younger, mostly female short stories. But I guess it might just be that those younger authors are on their way to getting novels published. But yeah, it seems right now that's the status quo. Yes, yeah. But I mean, short fiction, that's great. If someone asked me how to start translating, I'd always say, start with short fiction. Mm, of course. And Chinese writers, male and female, do some wonderful short fiction. So, uh, no, I, th I think these y young Chinese um, women sci-fi writers, you know, they're really going places. Yeah. Um, last thing about that. Um, there is a for podcast enthusiasts. There is a very good um, women in Chinese sci-fi podcast out there. I think it's part of the New Voices podcast, uh, one of the Sinica or Sub China podcast network podcasts. It was recorded in the Bookworm in Beijing, and it's Tang Fei, and then I forget who the other two ladies are, but it's um, it's three three Chinese sci-fi writers, I think, talking about sci-fi and being women writers in uh, in English, although Tang Fei is, I think Tang Fei is 50-50, she speaks a bit of English and a bit of what she says is relayed through a translator, but that's a really good episode. Yes, yes, yeah, I listened to that, it's great. Mm, right, so we got on a nice rich tangent there. Uh, last question, probably this is um, covering ground we've covered before, but is there any other of your own work or platforms you'd like to give a little shout out to before we say bye-bye? Uh, I've translated uh, a couple of novels by Jiao Ping Hua. Mm. I'd like people to go and read those Happy Dreams and Broken Wings. Uh, he is a very, very interesting writer. He's completely different. He could about as different from Yen Ge as, as you can imagine. Right. Uh, so they're both, both literary writers, right? Yes, yeah. Actually, they do have something in common in that he writes about his local area, Xi'an, and around the mm. village where he was born. But, I mean, completely different material. Um, and he's a very different kind of person. He's uh, he's a lot older, but uh, he does also write a lot in, in dialect. But that is is very, very interesting stuff. So Happy Dreams published by Amazon Crossing, and uh, Broken Wings, published by ACA Publishing. Mm -hmm. Both very interesting uh, publishers from a Chinese to English perspective. Um, if listeners are wondering, or if, if some of you guys are thinking, hmm, Cha Ping Hua, that name rings a bell. Uh, he got mentioned a few times by Dylan Levi King when he was on the show. Um, Dylan, I think, has a huge man crush on Cha Ping Hua, or at least <laughs> idolizes him. Yes, we we um we co-translated a long Jia Pinghua novel. Oh yes. Uh, together, which will come out uh, next year with Amazon Crossing. There you go. So there's something to watch out for. Um, I think I've questioned you enough. We're we're approaching an hour and a half now. Um, so I'll I'll probably leave you to the rest of your evening now. But thank you so much for being on the show, Nikki. It's been it's a very nice chat. Yeah. Yes, very very nice. Thank you um, very much. Yeah, thank you too. And um, you're very welcome back on the show sometime in the future because I'm sure there'll be plenty more things to say. Okay, yes, I'll take you up on that. Yeah, okay. Um, until then then, toodaloo.
All right, bye. Well, I hope you all enjoyed listening to that as much as I enjoyed recording it. That was a really awesome talk with Nikki. One of the top, if not the top, uh, Chinese to English literary translators living and working in the world. So, yeah, I'm extremely humbled to have had her on. Uh, before I do the next episode, I will have attended the uh, Lead Center for New Chinese Writings Symposium on Genre Fiction. Another thing I'm humbled to be involved with, I've been invited just to attend. So I'm, I'm hoping to do an episode on that, maybe just reflecting back on it like I did with the London Book Fair. Maybe I'll have managed to get some sound bites or some interviews from it. And maybe I'll have managed to get a few, at least one, potential guests for the show. I really don't know. We'll just have to see. But uh, in the meantime, just to repeat uh, the plugs from before, um, you can support the show on Patreon. The link will be in the show notes. Patreon.com slash Truchific. Same for buymeacoffee.com slash Truchific. Um, there's an Instagram account you can follow. Also Truchific. T-R-C-H-F-I-C. I, I just post stuff about upcoming shows ahead of time. And it's also a way you can talk to me. If you've got any opinions on the Chili Bean Paste Clan, that's a great place place, sorry, to comment or DM or whatever. And the other place you can do that and get some advanced news on shows and show some love is on Twitter, just on my own, uh, kind of my professional account, kind of my main account now. Angus Likes Words. That's a great place too. Um, most important thing is though, anyone you know who likes books, who likes Chinese stuff, Tell them about the show. Tell your friends. Tell your gang. Tell your clan. Tell your factory administration. Tell your driver. Tell your granny. Tell your mum. I think I've listed more than enough family members now. So until next time, Zai Jian. Bye bye.